Uh, wish you all a very happy Madras week. Welcome to this special edition, the Madras week special edition of the Bliss Catchers. This is our 30th edition. And I can see Ramesh walking in, Arvi So he, he has never missed a Bliss Catcher edition. He's been there with us in all the 30 editions. So uh, I always look to him for a sign that we can start. So thank you, Ramesh. Uh, this is the third season, for those of you who are new to the Bliss Catchers, this is the third season of the Bliss Catchers. And we can't be doing this fantastic program here month on month for 11 months of the year on the last Saturday of every month if it had not been for uh, the generosity of Ashwin and his team at Polisi. So I'd like you all to join me in thanking Team Odissi. And uh, I have two special guests who celebrate the spirit of Madras in their own way. Uh, I'll, I'll go on to introduce them a little later. But let's talk a little bit about the, their connection with the spirit of Madras. We have Janaki Sabesh, who's an actor, a uh, very popular actor, and who is uh, uh, you know, connected with cinema. Uh, and uh, Madras is all about cinema in a sense, right? So uh, we uh, have her with us. And then we have Akhila, who is connected with arts and culture. And Madras is connected with arts and culture. So that's why we call it the Madras Week Special, where we curated two stories which have a strong linkage with our city and its ethos and the way uh, we live and thrive here. Uh, what is Bliss Catchers all about? I always like to take a couple of minutes to introduce the concept behind this event series. Uh, because it's not another talk show, it's not an interview book going to happen here. It's uh, celebrating the journey of people and what makes them do uh, what they do. Uh, so to introduce the concept, uh, yes it is inspired by Joseph Campbell's philosophy, the American mythologist and author. It is inspired by his philosophy of follow your bliss. Uh, but to introduce the concept, I had, uh, uh, you know, an interesting uh, email interaction with a regular guest who used to be in the audience for us at the Bliss Catchers. His name is Rajkumar Balasubramanian. And a few months ago, he stopped coming. He was regular in the, in the, particularly in the second season, and as we started the third season, he used to come regularly. But about four or five months ago, he stopped coming. Then suddenly I received an email from him last week. And Raj said, that Avis, thank you for Bliss Catchers. And it's because of Bliss Catchers and the optimism and the joy that I derived from it that at the age of 53, I went on to write my first book. And his book is titled, The Untold Love Story. And it's gone up on Amazon. And he said, if at the age of 53, I was not going to follow my bliss of telling stories and of writing poems, uh, he, he asks in the email, when, when would I do it? So in a way, the Bliss Catchers was a catalyst. And so the Bliss Catchers is really uh, an event series that celebrates the aspirations and the journeys of people. Yes, we are inspired by uh, Campbell's philosophy, but we're also here inspired by our many, many guests and their journeys. We go on to our guests very quickly, but I'm reminded of Osho, not Rumi, but Osho right now. And Osho says that what makes you feel good is always good. What makes you feel beautiful is always beautiful. The joy of doing something that you love doing is the only truth that you need to look up to. And that ananda, that bliss of your truth, he says, is what should drive you to live the life that you want to live. And I think that's what Rajkumar did. That's what Vani and I do. And that's what all our guests who come here and join me and talk to me do. For Vani and me, this is a beautiful journey of expressing ourselves. Uh, Ten years ago, our life turned upside down. We went bankrupt. We still remain in the same state. But through these ten years, we found great meaning in our life. So we spend all our time trying to fix our business, that's on the business side of things and uh, we are, as long as we are batting and there are dot balls and our wickets are not lost, we know that we, we will get, uh, uh, life will bowl uh, 
uh, you know, a short ball and we will be able to hoist it to the boundary. But that's not happened in 10 years. So the runs are not coming, but we are batting there. But you know, what keeps us engaged and thriving is our purpose, which is to inspire people to be happy despite our circumstances. And that is what risk catchers or any of the other events that we curate, that's what it's all about. So for Vani and me, it's a, it's a personal journey of sharing not only learnings that we have learned from life, but sharing the journeys of other people that join us every month. This month, I have two wonderful ladies, Janaki and Akila, and I'm going to introduce them in my own way. So uh, let me start with Janaki with a disclaimer. She is a very, 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 very close personal friend. Uh, we know her family for years now. But that's not the reason why uh, she's on the Bliss Catcher show. In fact, she asked me, why me on the Bliss Catcher show? And I said, very few people can manage a corporate job and follow their bliss and kind of, you know, follow it in the, in the manner of trying to unravel different facets of it. So she's been an actor for over two decades now. She started with uh, Minsara Kanawe, if I remember right. And her most recent re release was Singham 3. She's played mother to almost every actor in uh, Tamil films. So she's been Vijay's mother in Delhi, and she's been uh, Jyotika's mother in Vete and Player. And she's been mother to many, many, many people. So we call her Ma Janaki. <laughs> okay? So that's Janaki for you. She's also the head of stakeholder engagement at uh, Real Image Technologies. So she keeps a full-time corporate job. And she's a storyteller. Her uh, venture or her uh, uh, you know, storytelling brand is called Gorpo, Tales Unlimited. And the target audience is children. And I'm curious to understand, which you know, we will all learn from today's session, why she does what she does. And how does she manage to put it all together? I'm missing Badri in the audience today because he often asks this question. Does bliss have to mean that you quit something and do something else? Is it absolutely necessary to leave something and move into another territory? And Janaki is a perfect example of not really having to do that. On the fact that you can arrive at a balance if you're a good manager of your life. And that's Janaki for you. Thank you, Janaki, for joining us. We'll talk a lot about Janaki's journey. And uh, my challenge will be to ask her all the questions that I have never had the answers for. So despite knowing her personally so well, and I'm sure there are others in the audience, including Sabesh, maybe Sabesh will discover some elements about Janaki which you haven't known, Sabesh. My other guest this evening is um, Akila. Now, Akila and I have a couple of similarities. Uh, I was a journalist also, I don't know if you know that. At some point in my life, long, long, long ago, I was a journalist. Now, what journalists do is they love, and I, I'm talking about myself, I'm not talking about Akila, okay? Uh, journalists normally love their power because as a journalist you wield a lot of power. You pick up the phone and call somebody and they better answer because it's you. So journalists wield a lot of power and there are a lot of perks of being a journalist. You may not make a lot of money, but there are a lot of perks of being a journalist. At least, you know, back, back in my days we never made a lot of money. So I've been a journalist, still, still being a journalist don't, right? So, uh, <laughs> Journalists normally quit journalism and do one of few things. They either join the corporate communications team of a corporate, or they set up a PR outfit and go and do PR, uh, or they just become nice, good authors and uh, recede into the background once in a, a five-year time frame, they come out and put out books. It's very rare that journalists step out and do something out of the ordinary. Uh, I wouldn't like to claim I did something out of the ordinary. Definitely the bankruptcy that we're going through is out of the ordinary. <laughs> but it wasn't entirely my doing. Uh, but uh, that apart, in, in Akila's case, she has done something very extraordinary. She's taken on a very, very niche space, which is to be in arts management. And working with artists to conceptualize, to curate, to present, promote and to deliver very interesting <coughs> events and concepts that are taken out of conventional performing spaces. So she, uh, a la her organization, 
is not about uh, you know doing music shows and dance performances in, like the way Savage would do in auditoriums. She makes art and culture accessible to people and in unconventional spaces. So to that extent, she is a very, very different person, a very different journalist turned arts manager. And I'm curious to understand how did the transition happen. So we'll have you speak with us very soon. Akila, thank you for joining us today. So may I invite both Janaki and Akila to come over here and join me. So for those of you who are looking at us, if you look at us very carefully, we wanted this to be Madras Week special, and it's ending up to be very, very special because you have red, you have black, and you have, you know, you can call this white. Okay, those are the ADMK colors. So we we we've given you a full package today, and we, let's get on with the uh, with the conversation. We're going to be party taking. <laughs> Well, um, thank you, Akira, thank you, Tanaki. Can you turn on your mics, please? Now, before I forget, uh, a very important announcement. Next month's Bliss Catchers edition is not on the last Saturday, because the last Saturday happens to be Vijay Dashmi. So next month's Bliss Catcher edition will be on 23rd September, which is the Saturday before the last Saturday. And we have three very interesting guests join us. I'll talk about the guests at the end of the show. But just for those who are regular, uh, please remember it's not the last Saturday in September. It's it's, uh, it's on 23rd September. Venue is here. Hmm? Venue is going to be here. Venue is always here, unless they throw us out, <laughs> which I don't think is likely to happen. Shub shub <laughs> Okay. So let's get started. The way the conversation will pan out is for the next uh, 45 odd minutes. Um, Janaki, Akila, and I will be in a conversation between us and going through their journeys. And then we will come to the audience for your questions. Uh, and then we will have a quiz segment, which will be uh, uh, when uh, Akila and Janaki ask their questions and you get a chance to win these beautiful mugs. <laughs> there is also a midway quiz that we will hit around 7.35, 7.40. Uh, when I will ask you a couple of questions about these two ladies and if you answer those questions you get these beautiful mugs and for those of you who are new these mugs are very well fought for so there are people here with enough collection uh, uh, of mugs at home so uh, look forward to those quiz segments let's get started thank you for joining us thank you. and um, uh, let me start with um, Jariki and then we come to Jariki. so uh, Jariki my first question uh, to you Given that almost two decades you've been an actor, and the last three years is it that you've been doing Golpo? Golpo, for, uh, she will talk a little bit about it, but Golpo in Bengali means uh, story. So, Tales Unlimited Golpo, that's what uh, uh, Janaki's outfit is called. And um, uh, so, my question is you've been an actor for all these years, and you've been a uh, you know, storyteller in recent times, particularly for children. But I want you to go back in time and talk about your own, uh, you know, maybe teenage or school. Or what, uh, what are the influences that uh, now you're able to connect back and say that drove you the direction of the performing space? I have very happy Midras week to all of you. Uh, thank you, Yudhis, for having uh, me here in this catch -up. Thank you for introducing me to another friend. Uh, the early experience, now that you ask me, um, the influence is that uh, I think uh, there was a movie called Moon Drum Direct, uh, which released in, I think, the early 80s. And, uh, yeah, so early 80s. So uh, there is uh, Sri Devi who. One second, Janaki. Are you able to hear her at the back? Okay. It's good? Okay, yeah. please continue. Sorry. So, uh, Sri Devi, there is a dialogue which uh, she becomes a child. She loses her memory and she goes back and she becomes a child. And there is this one dialogue which says, uh, So, I used to love listening, uh, I mean, I love the movie, and I used to keep repeating this dialogue. 
And I don't know, I think it got the fancy of my dad. And my father used to, whoever came home, he used to make me sit in a, a chair and he'd say, can you just repeat that dialogue? Can I ask you to repeat the dialogue, please? <laughs> I, think, I, I think you caught the audience too, but too much by surprise. So can you just repeat it? So, <laughs> so that is how, uh, you know, I got instant gratification. I mean, here was somebody, anybody who came home, they, uh, Appa made me perform this and uh, he was so proud. I mean, it was just a dialogue. I mean, so I think that when you asked me today, I have to really think, I think that's the first time I actually said something like that. And this uh, carried on, you know, uh, maybe later on to act in drama. We stayed in a colony in Delhi. Uh, I grew up in Delhi, in Pashir in Calcutta and Delhi. And in Delhi, we used to stay in this apartment uh, where in those days, in the 80s, these apartments with 189 flats and all was unheard of. But we stayed in a small Agraharam, uh, 189 flats, all Brahmins. Okay, Tamil Brahmins. So we had these annual day programs and all that. And I was always playing uh, some mommy, uh, mommy will, you know, and they just selected me, they said, why don't you do that? And uh, I think uh, my dad uh, told me never to say no to an opportunity. So that has stuck to me. That is here to stay. And uh, I think that is what uh, led me to this entire, uh, I mean, now that, I mean, I'm sure Appa had uh, never thought that I would get into acting because Modeling, all that was a no-no. You know, all that can be happening after marriage, but nothing. <laughs> but uh, drama was something, uh, you know, annual day program. So I think that was the first time. Because even to this day, I remember that dialogue, and I remember that uh, number of people who used to, you know, clap for me and say, once more, once more. And so, so, so wonderful. Uh, a related question. So, how does the journey for because of you said that uh, Appa didn't really uh, think of uh, kind of you know leading you up to the uh, acting space, okay, as an actor. So how did something like Insara kind of happen, or the or the modeling assignments around that time happen? If I remember right, you you were at that time working for JS Films, and they uh, they were making ad films, and they were connecting a lot with uh, brands and uh, modeling assignments and all that. So uh, work. Was that an advantage for you, or how did how did all that start? Um, uh, since it's stories, there's another story as to why uh, I got into modeling, and it's because of this one woman sitting here. There are some here, chairs in the middle, please. My mother-in-law, Sita Lakshmi Subramanian. She, uh, I was newly married in Bombay, and uh, I used to give a lot of voiceovers in Delhi. So she said, uh, let's do. Uh, you know, there are a lot of these uh, uh, all Hindi or Tamil dubs used to happen in a, a particular studio. And uh, she said uh, one day that uh, where the sari, we're going to the town. We used to stay in South uh, Bombay. We have to go to town and wear a sari. But I said, why should I wear a sari for a voiceover? She said, no, no, no. I mean, when you married, where, when did you get an opportunity? Wear the sari and we uh, went in the local train, bus, taxi. And then I get into a studio and it is an audition for an ad. It's not voiceover. So I'm like, I said, Ate, why? she said, you know, just do it. I'm like, but I've never you know, acted, I mean, I've never modeled. She said, no, 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 just, just model that. It happened to be the audition for uh, Ariel Soap. Okay? They used to have, always have this Tamil version. You know, so you'll have to have Tamil looking audience, I mean, uh, protagonist. And uh, Hindi will have Hindi models. So I, um, uh, like those jail, you know, you have to stand with a, a little slate with your name written and, you know, uh, your height. And it's like, Ate, I don't think all this will. She said, just, you know, Bindas, just think you're doing a voiceover. And that's how I got selected. 
and uh, this was uh, Vinod Pradhan, the uh, cinematographer of uh, I think Parinda and all, very very well known at that time. He was a cinematographer and I got uh, the role of this uh, South Indian girl and uh, her husband who will be on a, uh, you know, I think the sh shooting was in R. A. Mill Colony or something and he just shot to a jingle. So that was my first, uh, you know, so it's got nothing to do with JS films and that was my first modeling assignment. So that was much before JS films? Much before, this was I think 91. And how did something like Vinsara Kano happen? So uh, Rajiv uh, and uh, I, uh, and Rajiv Menon, I think, uh, asked me, I was editing in the studio and he suddenly asked me, will you model for me? I said, yeah, sure, you think uh, this face can sell any? So he said, no, no, you don't worry about all that. So uh, he cast me in a hen poem. And then uh, one day he said, Janki, can you come to Avian Studio? So I went to Avian Studio and he said, can you remove your photo? So I removed my photo. He says, ah, so she's getting the sister of the world. I had no clue what this was. I knew he was making a film and he said, you're coming, uh, you're going to act. That was your first film? That's right. And you play a sister in that, as, yes. in, as in a uh, nun. That's right. You play a nun in that? Yes. Okay. So that's how it really happened. Yeah. Thank you. I think one important point I'm picking up is, and uh, that may be an interesting takeaway for people, which is never say no to an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, when an opportunity comes, uh, take yeah. it, hold it, enjoy it, then continue with it. If you don't enjoy it, you can always drop it the next time. So never say no to an opportunity. And many of us, I think, uh, judge a book by its cover. So when an opportunity comes disguised, we don't know. Right? So that's what I'm picking up from, from, your, from your story so far. Let's go to Akila's story. And again, I have a similar question. Your early influences, considering that you're so immersed in arts and culture now, and a lot of your work is um, very unique. Uh, it, it has a lot of depth, at least as a, as a consumer of your work, watching you from, from the outside, uh, as somebody in the, in the audience when your events are going on. I always feel that there's a lot of depth. And uh, uh, my question is, did you at any time when you sit back and reflect, think of times when you were younger, when there were influences in your life that pointed in this direction? of arts and culture. Um, firstly, I was thank you very much for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. Um, secondly, thank you for your very, very kind words, you know, words like depth in what we do. That's really why we do what we do. So thank you very much. And thirdly, it feels really strange to not be the one asking the questions, <laughs> to be the one who's responding to questions. But I'm going to attempt to uh, answer uh, the question about early influences. Um, I think that, um, like all uh, South Indian Tam Bram girls, I was initiated into dance and music. I learned Bharatanatyam and I learned Carnatic music for, the, for as long as I can remember now. Um, and uh, the one thing I remember very vividly was I went to Stella and my class was uh, soon after college. So Stella got over at 145 and I had to uh, walk to TTK Road where there used to be a place called Kalapitam uh, where I go for music class. And the thing I remember very vividly is I really hated class because it meant that all through the three years of Telamaris, I could not wear jeans. I would only have to wear salwar kameez and I really, really dreaded class. But my mother was very, very particular and she would religiously uh, pick me up at 4 p.m. until I started driving myself, pick me up at 4 p.m. and uh, with some, you know, like a cup of coffee and some fruits and whatever. And uh, of course, I, as soon as I started my master's, I gave up music. Um, I, my music teacher, Sulochana Parabi Raman, was not alive anymore. She and I became great friends and half the time I, she would, I would help her write her, uh, Friday, uh, her review. She used to write for the Friday review until she passed away. So mostly I was actually, you know, not singing but actually being her friend. Um, slowly I gave up classes because other interests took over. But many years later when I became a journalist, I realized I was naturally drawn to uh, writing about the lives of artists. And somehow when they spoke, I was able to connect with it and I realized that, that because I empathized with, I understood in some sense with what they said, I think it made a difference in the way I wrote. And I think they also sensed that I understood and I think they opened up to me in a way that made uh, the possibility of sharing more uh, real and honest and effective 
And I think that um, in some way, when I look back, I think uh, um, I'm, I'm truly extremely grateful to my parents for my mother, especially, for, uh, in a sense, forcing me, pushing me literally to uh, go through that, you know, just the routine of that class. And really, I think, pick up something that I think now has really helped me in whatever I do. So I think early influences, and we also grew up in a household full of music. I mean, Kishore Kumar is like, like my eternal favorite. Andy Burman is like, I'd die for him. Um, so I'm not just only attached to classical music. I'm extremely fond of old Hindi music. I grew up in a very small town in Maharashtra. It's not even on the map of India, actually. It's a little town of Balarsha. A little little village called Avarkum, that's where we grew up. But there was music all around. Chitrahar was very big at that time, uh, you know, and uh, and then I moved to Madras, I started learning Carnatic music. So I think music and dance have, in a sense, always been a part of uh, my life, in a sense, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm picking up an interesting point here. I think uh, if we look back at our lives, we can always find that experiences early on have always shaped where we arrive in a sense. Uh, there is always a connection. So no experience, in, in my opinion, goes based. Uh, it's teaching you something about life and it's always valuable, or can I say invaluable, in, yeah, in its own special way. Uh, if, if you had such a strong influence, and when you look back at uh, life from where you are now, if you had such a strong influence early on, and now you're totally immersed in arts and culture, uh, what's your, uh, what was your role as a journalist like? And you had a very long stint, 12 years as a journalist. Yeah. So uh, why did you have to go into journalism? You could have, you could have done what you're doing even earlier. Uh, any thought? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, I studied English literature and Stella Maris, and then I almost naturally gravitated towards writing because it seemed like the most kind of at that point the most logical thing to do. My mother said you should probably pursue journalism. I went straight and I did my master's in MOP and then I got a job at Z News. So I started reporting in Hindi initially. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you do television? Yeah, I did television for about a year. Okay. Until I gave it up because every night I'd be uh, walking home at like 10:30 p.m. and my parents would be standing in the balcony waiting for me like that. It was too stressful. And uh, yeah, so I gave up uh, television journalism and then I started freelance writing for a paper called Madras Plus, which used to be a supplement right. to the Economic yeah. Times. So I think. I um, you know, most things in my life, I guess, I haven't really planned. I mean, they've just happened and I've always just followed the, just gone along the way. I haven't really, I think also my life has been really always so busy. Everybody's always saying you're always busy, but I, I mean, I'm not using it as an excuse. I mean, I'm genuinely busy. My, my life has always been so full that I've never really had a moment to like pause and introspect and reflect upon things. And somehow it's worked like that for me. So I, I did this, one thing led to another. I liked the job, I stayed on, and my ex-boss, who was Matt who I mean, my boss who was managing Madras Plus quit. I almost, I naturally became the editor. And then I went back uh, to India Today. I worked in India Today group for four years. And then when the Times of India was launching in Chennai, they called me in to edit 16 supplements. So that was my really challenging stint. I was only 28, and I had to manage a team. And I had actually worked with a bunch of designers at that point, and they would like bully me around, and suddenly I'm the boss. It was a great experience. I mean, I, I literally learned on the job. So I think, um, and that's what I do with Alap as well. So I think uh, journalism really, really um, uh, reinforced uh, the fact that I really, really, really love listening to people and listening to people's stories. And, and I think that the, just the kind of people that I've met have set such high standards and have constantly encouraged me to keep raising my own bar. So I think uh, journalism has just been about, like often people tell me, don't you, don't you want to write a book? I'm like, I don't have an idea. I'm just really good at re-articulating someone else's idea. And I'm so happy doing that. I'm so happy to listen to your story and re-articulate it in a way that other people can, you know, find it interesting. So that's what journalism has, uh, you know, that's what my experience in journalism has been like. Fantastic. I'm glad you put it together that way because I had a question on, on, on writing itself, but you kind of answer it, answer it up front. <coughs> One of the things about uh, her story is also that she uh, continues to write and she has a very fantastic collection of conversations called The Cues, which you will find on the alap, the alap.com website, where she has conversations with every artist that you can think of. 
every performer that you can think of, and those conversations are very, very unique, well, uh, well uh, researched, uh, and uh, you know, well written pieces. So uh, I'm glad you brought it up because I missed that in the introduction, and I, I can say that. But one learning here is that I don't think too much Avis. I'm too busy with what I'm doing, and I'm just going with the flow. And I think that's a great state to be in. Like, really? no, it, it might seem <laughs> like sure. it might seem that you are uh, probably not uh, at a personal level. You're not reflecting enough, and I think the time for that will come. But as long as you're going, learn to go with the flow of life. Yeah. It's a, it's a great quality in itself. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing that as uh, as something very powerful uh, in you. Uh, we'll we come back to your quest. Uh, you know, I have a question, a related question, or maybe. Let me, let me ask you that question so we keep the flow. So how did something like ALAP happen? Uh, uh, was it an evolutionary decision to quit journalism and set up ALAP as an arts management company? Or was it like one morning you woke up and it all happened? This is my most favorite story. <laughs> also because it relates to my most favorite spot in Chennai, which is Sangeetas, which is in Aripura, <laughs> where I go every day. There are lots of my friends there who go there every day too. So well, literally in October, one fine morning, I was actually, I quit my job and I was freelance writing for nearly 10 months. And then my husband was constantly telling me that you're trying to basically make as much money as you were by writing for so many different publications and he's like, it's never going to happen. So I was like, okay, um, you know, I can't sit idle. So I'd just be like, and I can't say no. So somebody says, do a story, yes. Do another story, yes. So I was just kind of like all over the place. And then uh, for a long time, even when I was in the Times of India, I would often talk to my boss, who's a hardcore sales head, about the possibility of starting a performing arts magazine, which was not just classical music and dance, but also theater, cinema, you know, uh, rock, blues, jazz, whatever. He was like, there's no money. That's not financially viable. He's right. I mean, I learned that lesson much later. But um, I basically started Ala because I was curious to start an arts magazine, number one. And it was also like, uh, in my journey of writing about artists, I was really, I was, I often wondered, you know, as a journalist, as an editor, so many times, like, you know, the PR agent of a, of a, of a cinema star would call me. Uh, but like, if it was like a dancer, like Alandir Bali, for example, she would call me herself, and I'm like, hey, this is a Padma Bhushan, and she's, she's rehearsing, creating work, creating music. And does she have to like take time off to call me and say like, could you please do a story on me? Shouldn't she be having someone who's really going to free her mind space of all things that are not just not the, like the creative aspect only she can do, but things other than the creative aspect. So I was curious. I was thinking along these lines. So one fine morning, I just literally went to Sangeeta and I told my husband, this is Vijay Dashimi. I'm just going to start a folder called Pala. And I just, I like the word Alap. Somehow I, I really can't remember how the name came to me, but I literally went back home and I opened my computer and I created a folder called Alap. And I said, I'm just going to do something in the space of the arts. And I said, for now, I'll just call it an initiative with the performing arts. Uh, now we call ourselves an arts management company, but at that point we just called ourselves an initiative with the performing arts. And literally after that, it's like the universe just kind of started reaching out to me. I danced for Priyadarshini Govind called me, who's another dear friend who had written about extensively, said I'm organizing the Natyakala conference and will you please help me, like help me with it. That's about how much I knew. And I had taught journalism in a college called MOP. There was a young girl called Payal who's here with me. And I said, Payal, can you help me out? And she had, she was clueless. She didn't know head or tail of the arts. She joined me and literally like that we started Alam. That's, so that's, yeah. that's fantastic. It's a beautiful story. Uh, so it was, it was evolutionary. Was waiting to be uh, happening in your life, yeah. and you just seized it when when, it, when the moment came. Thanks, Sangeeta. Yeah. That place, yeah. Sangeeta, is there a yeah, favorite yeah. seat? Ah, yeah. Sometimes I don't get my favorite seat because there's someone who's more enthusiastic than me who reaches there. Before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to I'm going to take a, a break, but before that, I want to. Uh, so, you, if you have questions, you're going to wait till the end. Uh, I'm going to take a break for asking my questions to the audience, but before that, uh, a beautiful point that came up was that um, uh, the, the idea for Ala, uh, the name came on its own, uh, came to you on its own, and you called it an initiative uh, in, the, in the performing arts space. Now, those of you who relate to management, 
and management concepts, you'll find this powerful. Uh, this takeaway that I'm, I'm inferring here is that many times great initiatives are born out of the market's unstated needs. Companies go out and do market research to understand what are the stated needs of consumers. But there are people who can conceive of ideas that meet the unstated needs of the market. So uh, her, her uh, Alarmel Valley anecdote is an unstated need of the market. Nobody out there, whether it's a Carnatic musician or a dancer, classical dancer, went out there and said, I need an arts management company in Chennai. But if somebody could sense it, that's great business sense. That's, that's, that's the uh, management side of things in my head. Uh, but that's, uh, that, that's a beautiful way to start. And we'll talk about how it has evolved, you know, from being an initiative in performing arts. But I have to go to Janaki's story. But before that, two quick questions. So your questions for winning the mugs come up here. And just so that I have the answers right, I'll hold my cards in my hand and close to my chest. Okay, so all set people, yes. two very, very simple questions coming up, okay? One on Janaki and one on Akila. And uh, from sitting here, because I don't have the bar stools, whichever hand goes up and gives me the right answer gets uh, is declared the winner and my decision is always right. <laughs> so please forgive me if you are not winning the mug tonight, okay? So the first question is, Janaki played Kamal Hassan's To Be Mother-in-Law in which film? I heard the answer. I'll give it to the answer from this side. I'm a bit confused. I'm a bit confused. I think the lady, the lady at the back. The lady at the back? Yeah? The lady at the back. Dr. Chari. It's in the family, Ati. So, <laughs> because three voices, I think we should have uh, Ashwin install some sensors here. Thank you. Thank you. One more mug in the family, Dr. Chari. So it was Vete Adam Vilayadar. She plays Jyotika's mom. I gave the answer in the beginning, if you notice. Yes. Right? So, uh, if you if you know how Avis thinks up questions, now you know, right? <laughs> you want to know that. Akila's question is um, equally simple. For those of you who love movies, uh, connect Akila Krishnamurti with Amitabh Bachchan. Alap. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, you need to give me the full answer. Alap the movie? Alap the movie? Absolutely. You are right. You are right, Gita. Don't be tentative. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're a big fan of Yes, I am a big fan of Amitabh Bachchan, yes. Alap, the movie, Rishikesh Mukherjee, 1977. And uh, it had two great songs, one of which Janaki's husband sings very well. Mata Saraswati Sharada, which is sung by Yesudas and Lata Mangeshkar in two different versions. And the other one was Maya Gata. Maya Gata Soja. Two Soja, something again uh, Yesudas. So let's continue with the conversation. Thank you, people. Two mugs given away. Two more mugs coming your way. This time, at the end of this conversation, we'll come to you with the quiz questions that they will ask you. So please wait until then. Those of you who didn't get a chance to win mugs, you still have two opportunities. So uh, Janaki, my question for you. How did, uh, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at your life as an actor, uh, at least I find that you, you've gone with the flow. Uh, 25 films or 25 odd films in about 20 years. You've really not gone and pursued being that, uh, you know, being that very, very successful actor, being all over the place. Uh, you've taken whatever comes to you. Why? Why haven't you been driven by this acting bug? And another point, related point, may I, may I ask you sure, that? Sure. Uh, which is that when you play mother to Aishwarya Rai, you were probably, you know, you were pretty young at that time. And you could have probably uh, given your introduction to films by then. You could have lobbied for a, for a heroine's role or a heroine's friend's role yourself, not a mother. So how did you uh, learn to just take things as they come and not really try it? So, um, after Minsara Kanavar, I, uh, I think one of the publications, Penny Money, uh, uh, had a uh, 
you know, interview about me and there were some nice uh, photographs uh, which Mr. Roth had taken and uh, uh, one of uh, Director Shankar's uh, assistants had uh, seen it and called me. I first thought it was a prank call saying Director Shankar and me and I didn't know much about Tamil cinema at that time because I spent all my life in the north. And then I told my husband, I think you should come with me. And then we met uh, Director Shankar. I asked him the same question. Did you think I'm too young to play uh, Aishwarya Rai's mother? And he said, no, I'm going to shatter that entire uh, myth, uh, you know, the image that people have about Amma uh, in movies. There's not going to be any wrinkle and things like that. So um, just like Akira did, I went, I mean, I just asked her, is it OK? He said, yeah. If you are confident, please go ahead. So I was thrilled. But imagine I was acting with S.V. Shekhar, Lakshmi Amma, Aishwarya Rai. And it was big, big dialogues. You know, I mean, and this uh, Tamil, in, uh, we speak the Palakar uh, Tamil at home. It was like the moment I used to open my mouth in Brahmina, you know, everybody used to ask me this question and all. So it was. It was something that uh, my dad used to call Ashit Dayan. Mm -hmm. That's plenty in our family. So I decided again to go along my father and my mother he used to say, don't say no, there must be something that is there for you and go ahead and do it. So at that point, I didn't even feel that I should be doing this and why am I doing the mother's role. I thought uh, the mother's role were very <coughs> safe. According to me, I said, it's very nice, I get to uh, play the role and I also get to see these big artists and all And Slowly, I've never been to any acting school except for uh, having done theatre as a uh, paper uh, with Mr. Faisal al in my mass communication masters in uh, Delhi. So, this was a learning experience. So, for me, I think after that, it just happened that, uh, but like one of my mentors uh, said that, do do so many films that tomorrow you will not be able to take an auto to go back home. So somewhere that I think stayed until date. Uh, if people take, I have seen you somewhere. You know, are you look very familiar. Are you from another? That happens. It's not like oh my God, look at that. And, you, know, and you don't miss the. No, no, no. You don't no. pray for it. No. I'm very happy. Very happy in the space that I am, and uh, it's nice because it leads on to some question answers, nice conversation, very happy. So you are happy being, uh, as Kavita Le Krishnan, my friend would say, you are happy being familiar. Yes. And being extremely popular. Absolutely. Isn't that a great state to be in? Yes. Yeah, yes. many people pray for just the, just the opposite, right? They want yes. the popularity here. Yeah. Right. And you've always been like that. You're very, content. Very happy, very content. Um, I have another question relating to your career in cinema itself before we go to Gopu. And that question is, uh, she assisted uh, Simi Garewal in a great documentary called India's Rajiv. And uh, uh, at some point did you not want to uh, pursue filmmaking, uh, having had that experience very early on in your life? And if you, if you ever thought about it, what did you do about it and why, why did you not pursue it? So uh, when we did mass communications, we were uh, I did it uh, in mass communication research center in Jamia Milia, which was one of the very few institutes in the 90s to offer uh, you know, post graduation in mass communication. Now you have this form, uh, electronic media and mass communication offered in every other college. So when I did that, you naturally, if they ask you, so what do you want to become? I want to direct a film. That was the I mean, That's the you know, uh, uh, that is the answer that people even expected out of you. But uh, when I came to uh, Bombay and I was offered this, uh, um, I, I said, okay, I think I'm a good assistant. And I said, why not? And I, I got a chance to come to Chennai. At that time, I wasn't living in Madras. So uh, when I came, I got an opportunity to meet uh, Suhasini and uh, Mr. Mani Ratham. So I went to their house and uh, I actually um, asked Suhasini, so um, I think I'd like to assist Mr. Mani Ratna. I'd like to be. So she looked at me, she says, are you serious? So I said, yes, I am. I, I think I am. I wasn't very 
uh, convinced, but because of this, uh, mm, you know, impression that I had for myself that I need to assist and move on, maybe to an that kind of money level, I said uh, there might be an opportunity where I might move to Chennai, and I'd like to do this. So she said, Why would you like to do? Why would you like to be the thirteenth assistant to money level? So I said, uh, no, but that is what I wonder. She says, yeah, I mean, you'll have to start by, you know, maybe doing some simple uh, chores on the set. And even if it means uh, getting coffee, tea, and, you know, you have to graduate to being the immediate assistant, you know, the right hand. So that stayed with me. I was, I thought I was not convinced, but somehow I went back to Bombay and, uh, you know, I just decided that, okay, maybe I should just remain here. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, months back, I actually called Hasini and I told her, thank you so much for that uh, advice because if she had not given me that advice, I don't know where I would have uh, you know, been, but I'm very happy in the space that I am in. Having some two, three things that I'm doing, they and uh, not, I, I might have directed my own film, but I don't have any. Happy I think the key operative word is I have been happy and she repeats it several times in, in both the answers. So I think that's that's the that's a very important learning for all of us. Uh, happiness means different things to different people and it's always your inner voice which will tell you what makes you happy and if you heed it then the chances <coughs> of being unhappy or uh, inviting suffering into your life are very 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 very. very. I can see that completely because in, in, she could have been, a, 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 you know, pushed herself and been a superstar. She could have pushed herself, been a superstar director. But in both both spaces, you have uh, chosen the line of contentment as opposed to ambition. Uh, and you say you there are no regrets. Well, that's a great space to be in life. Um, one one important question. So where does Golpo fit in all this? And Golpo see when you perform in a movie like when you are Vijay's mother. When you are Jyotika's mother, uh, you you know all those audience sitting here in theaters everywhere. You probably meet, meet them in airports, meet them in uh, you know malls, meet them on the street. Will come up to you and say, "Oh, my God, the the opportunity to interact with a very different kind of an audience." So why do you choose to tell stories to children? And uh, why Golpo? What's the idea behind Golpo? So can I just perform a small? Sure, sure. Yeah. Please go Can ahead. I just share a story? Please, please go ahead. Yeah. I have to stand for that. I, I can see some little ones here. Please argue with them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so once upon a time in Adyar, there lived a little boy, a little boy, or a man called Shringeri Srinivas. What was his name? Shringeri Srinivas. No, he had very long hair. What did he have? Long oh. hair. And he used to go for his annual haircut once in six months. We call it annual, but it used to go once in six months, he used to go for his haircut. So he went one day and he got up, he got up in the morning and he said, okay, I'm going to have a bath. He put patta patta vivadi and everything and he was ready and he told his wife, okay, I'm off for this haircut and he goes. He goes to the barber, but the barber says, oh, yo, yo, today I'm very, very busy, pa. You come tomorrow. No time. <coughs> But Shringeri Srinivas, like many of us here, when we want to do something, we have to do it that day only. Correct? So he goes back and he goes back to his wife and says, Listen, uh, uh, this barber, he's very, very uh, busy today. You have scissors. No, just cut my hair. No, nothing. No problem. She said, No, 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 no. I have a lot of work today. No, no, I am not uh, free at all. So he says, Okay, what do I go to? Decides. Goes to the tailor. He's in Roy Patek. So he goes to the tailor and he says, You have a katri, no, please cut my hair, no. So he says, No, 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 I'm very, very busy. All this Navratri order and all I have, I can't. So he says, Okay, finally. He says, Ha, chrome petal or a carpenter. Carpenter, get a monoda. Carpenter, you have a scissor, no, please, please, can you cut my hair? So, no, 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 I have to build mandam of Navratri steps. You, you, I can't do that. Very, very upset, and he goes walking, 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 and finally, somewhere near Wanderlor Zoo, they just heard, said that there was a panther which went missing. And can you imagine suddenly the panther and Shingiri Srinivas? Panther, Srinivas, Panther, Srinivas. He was petrified and he said, Ah! 
Panther said, today I'm vegetarian and went away. But at that moment, Shungiri Shrinivas lost all his hair. And he became Ote. So he didn't have to go to the barber. Okay? So we'll do a song and you need to repeat. Shringeri Shrinivas wanted a haircut. Come on. Shringeri Shrinivas wanted a haircut. Went to the barber, no time. Went to the barber, no time. Went to the barber. No, next step. Five, five, five. Went to the wife. No time. Went to the wife. No Went to the tailor. tailor. No time. Went to the carpenter. carpenter. No time. Then Roya Pete. Saida Pete. Saida Pete. Chrome Pete. Chrome Pete. Vanara Pete. Roya Pete. Saida Pete. Chrome Pete. Vanara Pete. Shingeri Shrinivas wanted a haircut. Shingeri Shrinivas wanted a haircut. So that's how my ball poor happens. <laughs> I'm so happy, I'm so happy you did this. Because we, you know, otherwise it would have been just a, uh, you know, a theoretical, abstract way of expressing it. So for, for a minute, I mean at least for this three minutes, you were not the bliss catcher audience for me. You were just children. Okay, all of us have children. I mean, we all are children in our hearts, right? We, we, we have that child in our heart and that was aroused when um, this famous storyteller Gita Ramanujam who runs Kathalia, she came to our office and in, uh, for a talk and uh, she told the story and I was mesmerized. Earlier I used to do sing-alongs in good books, in hippocampus and I used to just do sing-alongs. I never, I mean obviously uh, with little stories but I was so awestruck by Gita Ramanujam that when I, uh, when my HR had said why don't you thank her, I told her a story, something, you know, I don't remember but I, I remember saying thank you in the form of a story and I said, that's it. That this was the first time you said a story? Yes, yes. And I said, this is what I want to do. So I did uh, join Eric Miller and uh, I did a small course and then I went to Gita Ramanujan and uh, in my yoga class one day, the Eureka moment, I said, I'm so fond of Calcutta, there's a lot of Calcutta still in me. Uh, I said, I'm going to call it Golpo. Because there is that thing about everybody will now know what Golpo means, okay? So of course people, they Golgappa, Boplo, all that happens, but no problem. I don't have a problem telling them, correcting them, saying that that's Golpo and that story. So that's how Golpo happened. And when I went and did this course, uh, like she uh, said uh, in her um, experience, she told me, she didn't tell us what it is to do, you know, storytelling, the techniques are different, I use songs, I might animate myself. If, if there were just children here, you would have, I need this entire space. Okay, I'll be all over the uh, space. But she said the essence of storytelling is not in telling, it's about listening. She said the moment you start listening, you will be able to tell better because you're not listening to your own. How many of us multitask and do so many things, but we're not listening to ourselves, we're not listening to what people are saying. So I think I've become a better listener as uh, I didn't think my husband can still agree. <laughs> but I think I've become a better listener and that's how God, I just get immersed the stories and if you if you look at uh, storytellers from Africa and all, you know how they give freely the stories and they say, they perform the story and say, here, take the story, it's all yours. Stories need to be told, you can't lock it up. So stories, whether it's Shringeri Shringivas or Gajapati Kulapati or Little Vinayaka, whether it's any anybody, I mean, stories need to be told and it's amazing when these stories are even told in corporates. You know, they become just like them. They, because we love this thing, we are wired for stories. So that's how. And everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a special yes. story. And uh, you just connected very well with the audience. Thank you so much for bringing that very impromptu set. Let's come back to Akila for. I can't uh, sing. <laughs> I have a different question for you. I have a nuts and bolts question for you. So, when you are in the predictability of a job, especially working for a brand like Times Media, uh, 
there is a there is a paycheck that comes every month. And I heard you say that in the, in the initial phase of uh, quitting that regular job, you were trying to uh, salvage your income stream from different st uh, streams. Uh, life as an entrepreneur is is very tough, and uh, you know you don't get a regular paycheck. And uh, you, when you're trying to promote a concept and getting people to buy into it, uh, the, the money is not so easy coming in. So how do you deal with that life? Uh, how did you deal with it then? How are you dealing with it now? Uh, how how rattle do you get looking at your cash flows? I think um, you know it's 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 one of the first things that struck me when I became an entrepreneur was I realized that how much we, when we have a job, faff. Okay, so you can faff around for 20 days in a month and still get a paycheck at the end of the month, right? <laughs> Nobody is going to like, unless there's a KRA, something that happens, performance review that happens and then like whatever. But I realized very early on in business and I think I've, I literally haven't like, um, I don't think I've taken a single day off and my husband is probably and my parents know this, that I don't get even one day off. I'm always on my cell phone and they think I'm just like, just fooling around, really I'm just like working. Um, so yeah, so the thing that struck me was if I missed one day at work when I'm on my own, it was like I was not making, I was losing out on an opportunity. I'm not even talking about money because if money was what I was looking for that I wouldn't have been in the business of the classical arts. But it, that was one of the earliest learnings. Uh, and we're still negotiating that. I, I can't say that we're, our cash flows are amazing, uh, but by and large, I think the universe has kind of um, um, uh, recognized that uh, uh, we are uh, trying to do something fairly uh, innovative. You know, it was many times people don't understand. It's very difficult for me to explain what we're actually really selling a concept. We're not, we're not a product company, we're a services company. And we're selling services that are in the business of the performing arts. And uh, you know, often I, I have this moment where I question that, okay, what is it that, you know, there are so many event managers in the city, what is it that we are doing differently that they cannot do? I'm always having this conversation with pirates. But I think that, um, that in some way there is a certain something that we're bringing to the table. And I think it's, it's a journey that we're constantly still negotiating that. So it is, it is in a sense, uh, difficult. I mean, it's definitely like every day I'm like, I cannot miss, um, you know, recently my father had a surgery. He was in the hospital, but I was, I was sitting outside. And the next day you had an event. We had an event and you realize that life is, I mean, you have to go off. That is equally important. I can't say that I can just, you know, throw away the event and just be like, okay, now I can't do anything. I mean, the universe was kind enough that my father's surgery was just the previous night and I could show up and I enjoyed every minute of that event. And I realized that's, that's the beauty of being on your own in a sense, that even though it's so challenging, it's superbly gratifying. And I think it's like having a relationship, right? I always think of Alap as a person. And I think it's, it's like, um, uh, you know, it's like, I have learned from Alap as much as Alap has learned from me. I think we're, we're inseparable like that. So there have been moments of uh, extreme frustration, uh, extreme disillusionment, um, uh, but also extremely gratifying moments. You know, whenever I would go for sales calls, and I'm a journalist, and I was when I when I was a, an entrepreneur, I had to do sales calls, cold calls, and I used all the contacts I muscled up by virtue of being a journalist. All the people I'd written about, I'd show up, and they'd be nice to me initially. But literally, I can say this with conviction that every time I've made a sales pitch. Not like every time people have given me money, but almost always everyone has, said, has told me that we really, really love your passion. And we really hope that we could help you, but we are either not interested in the performing arts or our, you know, we don't have the money. So, so to answer your question, it is, it is, it is difficult. But we are negotiating that space and it's a learning experience. And uh, yeah, you kind of You could have said it better. You could <laughs> have said it better. That's the, you know, just see the joy in the way she expressed herself about her relationship with Allah. And that's really what bliss does to you, where you um, you are in love with what you're doing, and so you're willing to go through that ordeal, if need be, at yeah. times, yeah. the challenges that come with it, yeah. in order to uh, do what you love yeah. to do, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like being in a marriage, right? There are 10 bad days, but there are 20 good days, vice versa, too, <laughs> right? But you're like, okay, but there are like 10 good days, so maybe I'll just like, 
stay in this marriage. But if there were like 30 bad days in a month, you're like, okay, it's time for a divorce. That hasn't happened yet, but yeah. <laughs> very, very nice to said. I, I, I would only say it's very nice to said. <laughs> uh, Hope my husband's not here. Yeah? He's, yeah. We're recording. So, be relieved. <laughs> what do you do when you, in your space, you also have to deal with a lot of artists' egos. Uh, the, the, the space itself offers some challenges apart from the business. Uh, how do you negotiate that? And uh, how, what have you, what, what has been, how has that not dampened your enthusiasm? I think you might have started off with some people even uh, closing the door on you and saying, I don't think this is why this works. How do you motivate yourself? Actually, to be utterly honest, that hasn't happened. I mean, people have really, I think I built it also with the confidence that I had sort of built up a certain relationship with these artists. And of course, there are moments of disappointment. People are always like trying to, you know, like cut costs. And I never do the financial talking. I have another person who does that. But I, I realized that uh, it's okay. Like, I mean, uh, it's exactly like this. So I meet somebody and they're really, really egoistic. And artists are very, very egoistic. It's very hard working with them. But you know, I realized that I come back and I crib about it and I feel really dejected. But what I learn from them, or just the fact that, you know, that they are so talented and many of them are mothers and, uh, you know, wives and have such full lives and I'm like, what am I complaining about? And they have the skill and the talent and I'm only learning from them. Of course, I feel extremely dejected. I mean, there are so many moments when I'm like, I'm not going to work with this artist ever again. Some artists treat you badly, some artists don't pay you on time. All that happens, sure. But you kind of also realize that the, the the pluses, just the fact that you get an opportunity to work with people who are constantly pushing you to raise your own bar. You learn you learn something from everyone in this, from everyone. From from one artist without naming, I've learned perfectionism. From another artist, I've learned the ability to multitask. From another, I've learned the, just the amazing ability of endurance. Someone just lost a lost a very close relative and showed up to at work the next day. I mean you learn a lesson or two from everybody. So I think that is really what has really kept me going. Of course, there are moments of severe frustration because you're not even, you're working with individuals and you don't make that much money and you always have to be nice. And I've built this relationship, I mean, built this business purely on relationships. So it is very, very important for me to preserve them. So I'm always smiling. I'm never saying a no. I'm always taking a call at 10.30 p.m. if they've finished their rehearsals, taking care of their families and calling me at 10.30 when I have to not, I have not yet taken care of mine. But, but there's something about it that kind of, you know, supersedes, oversees, I mean, overpowers all this. And that's why I think I, I mean, I'm continuing with this journey. That's a nice way to be uh, motivated. That's a very nice way to be motivated. Because what, what I'm sensing is that you, you're dropping your own sense of ego and offering yourself as a student to the process. Yeah. Uh, you're not coming in as that specialist. You are that specialist curator, yeah. but you're not bringing in that ego. And yeah. I think that's fascinating because yeah. if you did that, you would probably uh, have a lot more struggle on your hands. Yeah. Right? I think that's a big learning. Can you approach your life with the, with the, with the attitude of a, of a student willing to learn? And that requires a lot of unlearning as well. Absolutely. So you're seeing the, the, the positive side of each artist and you're you're going along with that flow. And it's also a lovely feeling when you work with such fantastic artists who are actually saying, can you give me an idea? So that's also a huge ego boost, right? You're like, okay, wow, so they, they need me. So I think it's... Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. And what is life without challenges, right? So, um, Javiki, I have a uh, related question for you. Uh, any reason why uh, you have, so uh, this question has two parts and then we'll go to the audience for their uh, questions. Um, the two parts are, uh, any reason why you have uh, continued in your corporate job, although with, 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 so, with your body of work in cinema, you could still be uh, earning a living from cinema perhaps, if you, if you just checked out there and said, I'm, I'm available to do more, more films, but you haven't done that. So has it been because uh, you want that big, uh, security of the paycheck or has it been because you love your corporate job as well uh, and don't want to give it up? That's one part of the question. And how does one achieve balance between uh, you know, what, what you have to do to earn a living, what you love doing and what you deeply love doing which is now storytelling? So I will borrow this uh, line from Book Prater's book called Notes to Myself 
uh, a struggle to become a person. So who says that uh, a part of me wants to write, a part of me wants to theorize, a part of me wants to sculpt, a part of me wants to teach. So um, zeroing in on just one will be, uh, or to do just one thing will be killing off a large part of me. That's exactly what I am. I can't not do any of the things that I am doing right now. So the corporate job, what was, uh, I completed almost two decades with this company, uh, Cube Cinema, and what is amazing is that every five years, my portfolio changed. So there were added responsibilities and there's something completely challenging given to me. So I love the challenges and I love the fact that they have so much trust in me, the management, the top management, saying that here's somebody who could go and sell a concept called digital cinema when people had not even heard about it. So, you know, completely changing the way, becoming a, a part of a process which is pioneering process of changing the way people actually looked at cinema and also in the meantime, <coughs> do one film in two years and uh, also it's interesting that they are the same clients to whom I would have just gone and they would have spoken about their content saying that please give us your content, we'd like to digitize, convert it digitally and show it in Satyam. And here I am acting there. So they used to always take that opportunity to either grip about something or discuss something. I'm, I was not going back to my organization and saying, hey, I'm marketing there also, which I used to say it in jest, but that's exactly what it was so beautiful. They were, they were not parallel uh, paths, they, was, they were like all intertwined. And it was so beautiful because they used to um, casually discuss a lot of things which, you know, I could take as feedback and go back and, you know, put it in certain process which maybe on a, on a formal uh, conversation had never come up. So to answer your point, I love doing everything. So acting, modeling, I still want to publish my book which is a list of a lot of dreams yet to be. So there, there are a lot of things that I still want to do. And in your second part, um, it's the support. It's the family support. It's the support from friends, from family, from my sister, from my sister-in-law. Everybody who said that, I, I in fact, Jogi need to say that they have more faith in what I can achieve than I myself have. You know, it's like, oh, come on, you'll do this better. So it's like, oh, maybe uh, I need to do this. I need to try this. And why say no? I mean, try it and then fail and then say no to something. But without trying, how can you say that no, I don't want to do this? So this entire support structure at home, whether it was my parents, you know, when my daughter was growing up, and uh, my husband, I, I travel a lot to the job. So um, the whole balance and my daughter saying that it's okay. It's okay to travel. I mean, now we have FaceTime and everything. So 10 years back, it was not there. But uh, we used to um, have this 4 p.m. calls where she used to come back from school, talk to me and tell me. The story is continuing. What started with my dad uh, going uh, abroad and coming back and saying, I went into the taxi and then he dropped me at the airport. You know, he was so specific. That continues generation after generation. So I guess the entire family fabric and the corporate world and my uh, uh, now my storytelling. It's all, it's all, it's like a full uh, circle because it's all stories after all. What am I doing? At uh, corporate, I'm also telling them a story about digital cinema. In cinema, I'm enacting the stories. And with Golpo, of course, uh, it's the children who are instant gratification and who don't know my Dili uh, my role at all. They just know that this is one auntie who tells stories. So, yeah, Golpo auntie. And that, that is something. So, this morning when I went for an exhibition, there was a lady who said, aren't you the one who tells stories? So, I was very thrilled. But this was not somebody who said, I am Dili I I like that also, but that means recognition is also there and it's nice. That, though I wasn't looking for it, she, she, when she asked me, I thought it was very, very bad. Wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Uh, two important points I pick up. One is that, um, uh, you know, there is some part of me that tells me that I cannot not do some things. 
And I think there is that part in all of us. And sometimes when we decide not to do something in order to satisfy someone else or out of fear and insecurity, then we are leading incomplete lives. And that's what she's pointing to. You know, I'm, I'm just distilling it so that we pick up the essence there. And the other thing is the family comes a big way. You know, in her story, there is uh, Sita Mami here who uh, came, uh, came with her for her first shoot, audition, you know, audition shoot, and he is here with her even now in, in, in this bliss catcher moment. So the family comes a big way uh, in this, and I've always found that when you share your vision with your family, uh, in, in such a way that you're able to sell them the larger picture. They are extremely, extremely supportive. I mean, there may be situations where they are not, but in most cases they are very supportive if they understand the vision. So it makes a big, big, big difference if you have a supportive family. And thank you for talking about that as an integral part of achieving that balance. We cannot achieve that balance. We, we cannot achieve anything all by ourselves and definitely not that balance. Thank you, Janaki. Thank you, Akila. Wonderful conversation. We are now going to the audience for your questions. I would like to uh, uh, tell you that I am timing this and at some point I will disallow questions in order to move forward with the program. So please keep your questions, ask questions, comments on either of our guests. Observations can be reserved for offline, you know, when we finish. Yes sir, your question now. Uh, your... Uh, I can... Actually, it is not a question. And she said that she is very fond of her Kishan Kumar and Adi Burma. Can you hum one small like that? Just hum. What do you want to do? Do that. Quickly. Any song? Pulo ki rang se. Request. that I bring because of my job, uh, long hours, constant SMSs, so definitely, and of course my father who, who just is a, it's just like proud of everything I do and frustrated when I'm frustrated. So yeah, so these three people definitely, thank you. The same three people, but in my case, of course, my parents are no more, but they were, uh, they sowed the seeds of uh, the encouragement, the foundation was very strong and uh, blessed to have my mother-in-law who I keep threatening her that, you know, when we have our fights, uh, we do have our fights, uh, saying that I'll stop everything and stay back at home. And she's like, no, 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 please keep her working. So my mother-in-law definitely, my husband of course, and he was the uh, mute spectator, but silently encouraging and saying, why not? This always, there is a saying, why should I do, why not? And my daughter, my daughter who, uh, according to her, she's the mother and I'm the child now. It's called reverse genealogy. So, and of course, like uh, I told you this, the family and the friends support comes. We have a dosti group and uh, my sister. I think it's the family fabric, you know. Now, uh, the colleagues and all are there, but then every somebody who sees you from a very close distance, I think they are your biggest motivators. Very nice. Very nice. Next question, please. What's the satisfaction 
After Dr. Chari's question, we come here to Ram. What is the satisfaction you get out of both of you? Which is the one which gives you more satisfaction? Which work gives you more satisfaction? And I think that applies first to Janaki. Yes, story, because I'm weaving stories at home also. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, what I love is that attention that I give, uh, get when I tell stories, it's like a captive audience. There's no escape for them till I finish the story. So that is uh, very rare to come by and uh, kids, uh, friends, and uh, wherever. But yes, storytelling is very rare. I think uh, what I enjoy the most, and I think that that is something completely under-recognized in, in the concept of the work that we normally do, is curating ideas itself. Ideas often go unrecognized. And it's often, uh, you know, like you come up with a great idea, but really people are more worried about the way the idea is executed. But often enough, and for me, therefore, the just, just cracking a great idea is by far the most gratifying. You know, organizing the event is something that, most people are more efficient in that job can do, but I get the most joy out of conceiving an idea. And just the whole process that goes into realizing the idea. Because at the end of the day, I don't remember masala popcorn for uh, just the event, but I also remember it for being a one of a kind quiz on Indian cinema. So I think that conceiving the idea is really what is most gratifying for me. I'll come to Ram for your question. Ram, right? You, yeah. yeah. I'll come to you for your question, but I just want you, for the benefit of the audience, uh, you know, brief. Give them a flavor of, of an idea so they understand Alap's uh, range of work. Uh, okay. Something that, that talks about what Alap does. Um, okay, I'll give you two ideas uh, very quickly. One, we have a, a platform called Humans of the Arts. It's a platform that we have not grown as much as we'd like to because we have a lot going on. But it's basically just really, really short uh, human side stories of artists. You know, artists are real people. They have real problems. They have real honest confessions to make. So, HOTA, as we call it, Humans of the Arts, is really an attempt to capture the human side of the artist. So that is one editorial uh, voice that we have in Allah. Um, another alternating to that idea is the idea of BOTA, which is Battle of the Anklets, which is basically an inter-dance schools contest where we encourage teachers of dance schools to encourage their students to put together like choreographed performances and actually stage it in a platform where they often, you know, there's so much competition in Madras, like the December Marguerite season, only those who make it break or those who, you know, know a Sabha secretary or something just make it. This is a platform where we encourage like young, fresh talent to actually really like showcase work in an auditorium that they normally don't get an opportunity to. And it's also an opportunity for choreographers and dance teachers to come together as a community and not be insecure and really see each other's work because they're never really doing that. So we have Bota and Bota, but we have many concepts like that. One of the One, two of these. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ram, your question. Question, Ram. So while uh, when you see from outside, it looks like you're doing multiple things, right? One is like uh, the job, corporate job, uh, one is uh, cinema, acting in cinema, and then the story. Is it like the passion for acting and anything related to acting in cinema that's like common thread that keeps you going everywhere or is it like, are these like in your mind separate spaces you live in or separate things? If you see, at the face of that it's all different. But uh, like I said, it is story. Now if I, if you ask me what's my biggest fear, it's like forgetting those lines when the director says action. So it's, it's a lot of, you know, a combination of uh, um, keeping that story alive. But if you take a corporate job, then the common thread is the story. So if I'm emoting a, a character, I have to get into that character. I'm also doing theater. So it's, it's all the more, everywhere there are lines. In corporate, it's okay if you make a mistake. I mean, you can always say sorry, but in the other, Yes, you can't do that. And I never want the director to take another shot because I have, you know, fumbled. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but the common thread is the story. And uh, somewhere there is a link between all the three. Very nice. We have time for one more question, yes. Yes, yes, can we pass the mic, please? I don't quite have a question, but I'm going to take 15 seconds to publicly 
thank you both uh, for sharing your well thought of thoughts. Um, I did not quite know who you were before this evening, but it was indeed a pleasure to you. Thank, thank you for your thoughts thank you. and thanks for the host for curating it so well. Uh, in the end, although I think I would leave with one thought, if there was a male guest here and if they were not a musician, they said they like this specific music director, if they would be asked to perform a piece for the audience. You need to come. You need to come in October for that. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You need to come in October for that. We do have a good sprinkling of all genders, and we do have uh, uh, something very interesting cooking in October. In the October edition of Bliss Catchers. By the way, Bliss Catchers as a series is curated all the way till 2017, which is in November. We curated this opening season four for curation next month. So it's, it's so forward curated. I really enjoy that process of uh, you know, having a calendar full of uh, uh, events to look forward to. Uh, did somebody have a question there? I can take one more question very quickly. Yes, the lady at the back. And that will be the last question for the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'm not a great uh, speaker. I have a question for Mr. Bhutan. Uh, uh, while you say a story, uh, do you believe that every story that you say to a child should have a happy ending? And uh, 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 for Ms. Akhila, uh, it's basically uh, when you uh, curate or rather when you write stories for a performance, uh, is there something that where thoughts of stories or the plays or everything which is being done, do they also have a similar happy ending? Or is it like it has to have a happy ending? Or I might be confusing you. It's the, it's the same concept. Can it be carried over to both? So quickly, Janaki first. Okay. So most of the stories, I mean, the children who come for Golpo are between 3 years and 11 years. So uh, I was told by many teachers not to use uh, words like he died or uh, somebody. But then I think. Uh, the whole uh, uh, essence of any story is for them to enjoy it. And if you are able to weave in even death, there is a book called Grandmother Gone. And it talks about the death of a grandmother. I'm going to have that in my next storytelling. And it is very beautifully told. So even though it is, it has an unhappy, uh, not so happy uh, incident that takes place, it's the way you uh, conceptualize it because the book is just a skeleton. The book is just a skeleton. How you um, you know visualize it and tell the children so that they don't become sad, but you're able to showcase it. So I don't think all stories can have happy endings, but I'd like to showcase more happy endings because I think there's enough of sadness happening in the world anyway. Thanks, very quickly. Uh, yeah, very quickly. The thing is that uh, when we curate an event, we're actually really curating an experience. And like experience itself, there are many, many shades. So I'm totally okay. It's possible that you go you go for a concert and you can have each person can have a completely different experience. I could feel completely excited, somebody could feel terribly sad, somebody could come back feeling like super happy. I don't know. So the idea is really when we curate an event is to really curate an experience. And I think like life, every event is really it kind of fills you up with a, it leaves you with a certain mood. And I think it should be like that. It should never be about one because we're also layered. We are also complex. And what means one thing to one of you doesn't mean something to another. So I think the beauty of the arts itself is the fact that it's so complex and layered. And I think the experience also should be as complex as that. Beautiful. If this event left you questioning yourself, if this event left you inspired, if this event left you completely clueless about where you are in life, or any other option. All options are fine. That's what we mean to say. That's true, yeah. Thank you. Now, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to invite Ashwin from Odissi to come forward and uh, for us to give away uh, small mementos to our uh, guests over here. They're supposed to ask. Two oh, two questions they're supposed to ask. I was, I was wondering what we were missing. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, Ashwin, just hold on. I forgot the quiz questions because I'm looking at the time. So very quickly, quiz questions, please. Um, for those who have been following the alab.com incident in the very first artist featured in the queues, 
is celebrating 25 years of catching the country by storm with the first work which was fresh and like nothing music lovers had heard before. Which musical genius am I talking about? Who gave the answer? The answer came from Rao. <laughs> Although she took the mic, but he answered out of turn. We'll still give it to him. Yeah, she. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank so my first film was uh, Minsara Kanagar and what do you think was the first shot because it is linked with the song? I need the name of the song. Yeah, correct. That's right. Yeah, because I had to sing it Abhish uh, Shruti and not as such a bad singer. <laughs> you can sing it again for us. She used to watch this movie. Oh, great. Okay, can we give Ram and Atirupa a big round of applause? So we now invite Ashwin. Uh, because of Ashwin, we are all here. Thank you, Ashwin. I'm having an audio mis malfunction by you know, remote box of the mic fell off, oh. fell off my waist. Oh. So, I'm having to hold it back. But thank you, Ashwin. So, that's your this casual trophy. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we have a gift partner, which is Hazel. So, uh, you have a little handful from Hazel. All of you have the Hazel gift vouchers on your chairs. Ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me for another 90 seconds while I do a wrap of this event. Thank you, Akila, and thank you, Jan. It, it was a fascinating conversation. It was uh, very engaging, and thank you for uh, doing a little story. And thank you, sir, for asking her to ask you for my so she actually sang. Thank you. It makes it so beautiful. Uh, I, I want to wrap this event with a thought that's coming to my mind. This one is from a very famous um, author an American author called Annie Diller, who said that the way we spend our days uh, is the way we actually spend our lives. And she uh, put forth the idea that most of us measure our lives based on productivity. And productivity is about how much are we making, how much are we saving, how much are we losing, and it's always got something to do with material wealth and things. Whereas she says, if we started measuring our lives from a degree of presence, are we present in the moment? Are we enjoying the moment completely? Are we completely aware of this beautiful gift of life? If we live our life that way, by doing things that we love doing, then we will only be happy. And that's what I'm picking up from both Janaki and Akira. You have, you know, you, you often talked about being very rushed and full of, uh, uh, you know, doing many things. But you are enjoying the process. And you are, you, are, you are living a full life. And so are you. By choosing to do multiple things, as Ram asked, what is it that connects it? And you are now able to connect it. But even otherwise, you were clear in your head that your life would be incomplete without all three. So I think the chance, the opportunity is there for all of us to go live the life that we want. And this was another brilliant evening where we got inspired by both Janaki's story and Akila's story. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you liked this program, those of you who are new and would like to uh, stay in touch with me, you can download my app, which is called Avis Vishwanathan on Google Play or on the App Store, and you will be served my daily blog posts, podcasts, and blogs on your phone directly. The next edition of this catchers is on uh, September 23rd, Saturday, and it features three very interesting guests. We have sport as a common theme next month, and we have a Silambam practitioner, Aishwarya Maniwana. We have two young men who have given up their, um, you know, corporate careers and taken to taking sport to the Ahmad. And that organization is called Get Fit. And the people I'm talking about are Arun Karthik and Vikram Menon. So it's a young lot uh, next month 
on the 23rd of September. Do join us. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening and it's 8.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.